Hey there, I'm Priscilla and I am so glad that you are here. This is The Chat. It is a wonderful opportunity that you and I get to sit down together and chat about some stuff that matters to you or should matter to you. Things that you should be interested in and know about. And we're gonna to talk to some very interesting people as always. And so I hope you're gonna stay tuned because today is gonna to be a great opportunity for you to get to know about something that you might not be super familiar with, but you will be by the time we get to the end of our time together. So stay tuned, you are not gonna to wanna to miss this. Seven million. Okay, I'm gonna say it again because you got to get that number in your heart and in your mind before we dive into this program. Twenty-seven, not twenty-seven hundred, not twenty-seven thousand, twenty-seven million. That is how many people right now, as you and I sit here talking to each other, that is how many people are enslaved right now, held against their will for deviant uh, purposes, things that you and I could not even begin to fathom there are people experiencing right now. It is human trafficking. And sometimes I think we hear that phrase, human trafficking, and it's just this sort of distant problem that's happening somewhere else in other countries. And we feel like we can't put a name or a face with any of these people. We feel a little disconnected from it, but actually it's happening in your country right now. It is happening right here, right under our noses. And I don't think we should let you know, let it happen under our watch. I think we should care and be concerned about it. That's why I've, I've invited two of my most favorite people on the planet. They are friends of mine, um, wonderful folks who have an incredible uh, ministry, but they also have um, a, an organization that is designed to help put this to end. And so we're gonna talk to them today. They are Nick and Christine Kane. Will you please help me to welcome them? All right, first of all, I have to say I like your boots. Hey, come on, <laughs> thank you. And, um, and uh, those boots are made for walking because y'all are all over the globe, aren't I know, you? I know, you need flat. You know, other people want heels, but I just can't change the world in heels. You can't change the world in <laughs> heels, today. that's right. And you guys are changing the world. Nick, can you just tell us a little bit about how A21, which is the organization that the anti-human trafficking organization that you guys um, created several years ago. How many years ago? It hadn't even been long. Five years ago. Okay, so just five years. Tell us how it even started and then what you've seen happen in five years. Well, we, we were going to a, a, a women's conference in Greece. And as we walked through the airport, first in Athens and then in Thessaloniki, we saw all these pictures of missing kids. And as we came out, we asked the people who were meeting, says, what, what are the what's all the missing kids? And they said, well, they're the alleged victims of human trafficking. And we said, what's human trafficking? Yeah. And she said, I don't know. Um, so, we, <laughs> so we went and started to ask questions and then we found out that there was 27 million um, people enslaved today and, and that there were, it was a problem all over the planet. So we, we set out to, to try and do it and we started uh, A21, which is abolishing injustice in the 21st century. And um, we, we started with a, a project office in um, Thessaloniki, Greece, which was designed to, to lobby um, the police and the, the local government and uh, the, the government of Greece to be able to enforce the laws that they had and enact effective laws against human trafficking. Um, then we went from there to having a shelter um, and we've we'll be been able to help hundreds of girls through that shelter um, okay. and see um, many, many, many um, traffickers convicted. Last year, uh, we were involved in 95% of all sex trafficking convictions in um, Greece, over 80% um, of all labour trafficking cases across Greece. Um, and we've been able to set up transition facilities across um, uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, um, the Ukraine, um, and we're now starting in Thailand and South Africa um, it's amazing. <laughs> do, we're doing a, a lot of prevention and awareness work in um, the US and the UK and Australia. And uh, also we've just developed a whole curriculum for, to teach uh, year nine and 10 students across the, the US what human trafficking is, how to avoid it, 
and how, to, how they can be involved in stopping it. Because I suspect a lot of people would have the same response that that lady did in the airport that you were walking through. When you said, what is human trafficking? And they're like, I, I don't actually know. Yeah. Do you find that a lot of people are kind of like, what, what's going on? You need to tell us what's going on. Well, totally. And I think even if you use the word slavery, which is what it really is, whether it's forced labor, slavery or sex slavery, people don't actually believe that it still happens in the 21st yeah. century. Mm -hmm. They think, you know, that was eradicated. You know, we've come through that. And um, it just looks different, but it is more prevalent on the earth today than ever before in history, than ever before in the height of the civil rights movement. There are more slaves on the earth today now. Okay, we want to be able to put some names, some faces, mm -hmm. some lives with that 27 million. We need to boil it down to one or two or three stories sure. so that we can really get a handle on uh, what's happening. Because let me just say this before you tell some stories. When it really grabbed me, was when you guys said to me that, I don't know if it was the number two or three on the statistical list of the people that are trafficked the most. And you said to me, Priscilla, six-year-old boys are at the top of the list. Yeah. And at the time, my second son was six years old. Yeah. And that is when it totally grabbed me and it yeah. became my problem. It wasn't just something out there, it was my problem. Totally. Tell us what you've seen as you've gone to these shelters and met the people that are coming into your shelters. Yeah, I, what you see that is the most shocking thing is that they're normal, everyday people. It could be my daughter. I've got 11 year old, a seven year old. And so because we have a lot of girls come through, um, I see girls and think this could be my daughter. They're just, they're just normal girls that had dreams and aspirations, grew up mostly in abject poverty in Eastern Europe, were told a lie that they could have a job in another country. Now Greece is the parking lot of trafficking in Europe. And so they've come over um, thinking legitimately, I'm gonna work as a, a hairdresser, as a waitress. They're taken, and this would not be unusual. Let me tell you this story, Priscilla. Um, a, a girl was uh, brought over in a shipping container. Now. I didn't even believe this at first. It put on a ship in a container with 60 other girls thinking they were coming to get a job. The container was opened in Istanbul in Turkey and these girls were taken. They were put um, in apartments and then kept there with very minimal water, barely any food for two weeks, raped four or five times a day, every day for two weeks because what they try to do is break your defences down. Mm -hmm. Now they've taken mm -hmm. your passports, they've taken any of your legitimate papers, so you're in a foreign country, you don't have the language skills, you have no documentation, you don't even know what's happening. What they often do is the traffickers will dress up as police officers so that you will not trust any law enforcement. So now you have got five times a day what you think are police officers in this foreign country mm -hmm. beating you and raping you. Um, and then what they took, these girls, uh, 30 of those girls had died on the trip over because the oxygen tank in the shipping container broke. So when they opened that container, um, th there were only 30 of the 60 girls that were alive. Those 30 were taken, beaten. Then they put them all on these little boats to take them from Istanbul, Turkey to Athens, Greece. You can just take them across the M Mediterranean. Um, the Coast Guard was coming through so the traffickers, so that they would not get caught with these girls, threw them overboard, just like excess baggage. Now you've got to remember these girls are from villages where they've not even seen water, so uh, you know, know let, let alone how to swim. And um, 25 of those girls drowned. Five girls ended up in a brothel in Greece. Now you've got to think every one of these girls was between 18 and 21. And um, those girls then ended up in our transition home. I remember sitting there, this girl's telling me this story. She's having a post-traumatic episode as she's telling me. So she's screaming, she's reliving the container because her best friend Anna died in the container. So she's screaming to me, as in reliving the moment when she went to Anna trying to bring Anna back to life. I, I'm thinking, if I was not seeing this with mm. my own eyes, I'm mm. a little bit like Thomas, I would have been, I need to see the, the scars. Yeah, so I'm like, see, to believe, I'm yeah. listening to this going, you couldn't make this up if you tried. Yeah. And um, with her were 14 other girls from 14 different nations, all of them were between 15 and 24. And um, I'm looking at these beautiful Eastern European girls because the demand is so high because they are stunning, stunning girls. And um, one of the girls that had been rescued just one day before, so this girl just finished telling me this story. The girl jumps in, um, Nadia from Russia, and she's got very broken Greek. Greek is my first language. And so in very broken Greek, she looks at me, she's very scared because when they have been um, helped and rescued one day before, they don't know if I'm a trafficker or our yeah, organization. They, they don't, don't know, know who to trust. are you setting me up to yeah. take me to another place? And so she yells at me in very broken Greek. She goes, why did you come here? And I said to her, I began to tell her my own story, my own journey. And, um, and then I ended it with, you know, there's a God in heaven that loves you. He's got a plan for your life. There's a company of women around the world that want to help you. And they've helped me to come here to rescue you. 
And I'm, I'm telling her about God's love. I'm telling her about God's mercy, God's grace. And I will never forget this if you're wondering yeah. what still fuels me. Um, she yelled at me mid-sentence. She goes, stop, stop, stop. She goes, if what you are telling me about your God is true, if this is true, if he loves me, if he has a plan for me, then why didn't you not come sooner? And just that phrase, why did you not come? If this is true yeah. about your God, why didn't you come sooner? That fuels me pretty much every day. I guess it does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And why haven't we come sooner? What do you find is holding people back from being involved in this issue? Um, there's so many things. It's, the biggest one is complacency. We're, we're, uh, we live in a um, narcissistic world. Everybody is fully absorbed in their own life, in their own problems. Um, I got stuck in traffic this morning. Um, <laughs> my my outfit didn't look right. Yeah. All those really important my, things. My girlfriend joke, jokingly says those are rich people problems. <laughs> yeah. Those are but, yeah. you know rich yeah. meaning we just live in a first world yeah. country yeah. where yeah. we Full have stuff. modern conveniences yeah. and we just think everything is a disaster. You know our hair didn't work right this morning. There's a little traffic on the freeway, but yeah. then there's someone fighting for their life oh, totally. every single day. Totally. So people are just completely absorbed in their own lives. So they don't they don't um, they don't think about the poverty of others and. When they do, they become overwhelmed that, well, the problem is so big, there's nothing I can do about it, so all I'm going to do is just get caught up in my own little world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the biggest thing is actually people have got very sincere hearts. Um, but when you start sprouting off numbers, like 27 million, yeah. it's extremely overwhelming. And just the enormity and the magnitude of the problem, you get paralysed and think, I, I can't, what, what can I do? I can't do everything. So oftentimes we think because I can't do everything, we end up doing nothing instead yeah. of the one thing that could activate something. Yes. And so I think um, when I saw it, of course I was as overwhelmed as anyone else, but but I think Priscilla, if I I'd take it a little bit more personally, you know, I, when I was born, um, I was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted. My birth certificate actually does not have a name on it. It's yeah. just child's name and typed in next to that category is the word unnamed, number 2508 of 1966. And um, when you look at me, I mean, we're friends, we've got a life together, kids, family. Yeah. But um, if I said to someone, if I just put up a birth certificate photo here and we all just looked at something, it said 2508 of 1966, you almost, you don't really know what to do with it. So you kind of just go uh, put yeah. it in the oh, bag well. and just yeah. move on. But as soon as you go, that's Christine Kane, all of a sudden there's a name yep. and a face to yep. that number. It changes everything because numbers in and of themselves, they're dehumanizing, they're desensitizing. And I think that's what I love about the Lord because to God, nobody's just a number. Everybody's created in his image and filled with his purpose. So he doesn't see 27 million as a number. He sees individuals that bear his image. Yep. And so we have a responsibility, we who have been rescued, to rescue them. And I think um, when I look at it, I'm Greek, born in Australia. I happened to be left in a hospital that had a rule of law that had a legal representation. So someone couldn't just take me right. and traffic me out because I had to be adopted. Yeah. Um, there was proper documentation. There was a, a system I had to go the, through. That's not the situation In everywhere, Romania, though, right? in Bulgaria, in Albania, in Greece. I mean, they could have, if I was born there 47 years ago, it, I could have easily been one of those children that we often see in yeah. television that are chained to beds because that's where we get kids from because there's no records of their existence. So anybody walks in and says, oh, that's my niece. Um, I'll take that child and, they just take them. and then what they often do Priscilla is they'll take them they'll get they'll take the girls they'll sell them into brothels then they'll get the girls pregnant in those brothels intentionally then they'll take the girls across the border we've worked on some legal cases in Bulgaria where um, they take the pregnant girls into these things that are literally called infant farms and so they give birth uh, to children on those infant farms and then they sell those newborn infants into pedophile rings and um, then you don't even want to begin to know what they do with those children. And or they sell them for their organs. Organ transplanting is a huge thing. And um, we sit here and are not even aware that this, it is the fastest growing crime worldwide is the buying and selling of human beings. Faster than the growing of armaments and, uh, sorry, the selling of armaments and faster than the selling of drugs is the selling of human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, if we don't care, I don't know who will, because yeah. we actually are the people that believe Every human being is created in the image of God and yep. filled with purpose. So if we do not value the sanctity of human beings, I mean, I just think on my watch, I'm not going to let a whale or a tree have more value than a human being, basically. <laughs> yeah. 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 If we're going to save the yeah. planet, let's That's save, let's yeah. save totally, a human totally, being. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so 
I was sitting, I took my, my uh, oldest son on a date. He's 10 years old. Took him on a date the other day. We went to a hole-in-the-wall Mexican food place right around the corner from our house. Because y'all know that's the best kind of Mexican food. <laughs> the hole-in-the-wall kind yeah, of Mexican yeah. food. And um, so we were sitting there in this restaurant enjoying our quesadillas. And Jackson took a bite of his quesadilla and said, yum, yum. This is so good. And as soon as he said, yum, yum, yes. I had a knot drop down from my throat into my stomach because of something you all had told me just the day before. Hmm. Would you share that? In, we've just signed a, uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Royal Thai Police, which is allowing us to um, work in investigation um, in unison with the Royal Thai Police. We've actually got our own um, investigative unit, which reports to the head of the Crime Suppression Division of the, the Royal Thai Police. And um, they, they'll be going after the, the traffickers, particularly of young children, because in Thailand it is a really, it's, it's just a really common problem. And where you can, you have a lot of Western uh, men going over and looking for sex from all sorts of, all sorts of the most perverted things that you could possibly think of. And one of them is um, th th they can't teach the little kids some of the, the, the complex terms, but they will just go and offer the, the men yum yum. And you'll have little little boys and little girls as young as four and five years old um, coming up to, to men in the red light districts offering yum yum. Um, and Basically them, their bodies. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, oral sex in particular. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oral, yeah, oral sex in particular. And um, we, we've got video footage of, of these young kids um, just offering a, our guys, you want yum yum? We, Offering your team. Yeah. They don't know that your yeah. team so is your team. So they've gone in invest as undercover investigation with cameras and so um, and just to to reveal that this is the issue and this is what's happening and you know you've got little kids I've got a seven-year-old daughter yeah. and I, I can't watch I have to just turn it off because it is so sobering and what is even more tragic Priscilla is the greatest demand comes from Western men North America and Australia and you know in our car they'll fly over under the guise of a business trip and it's almost incomprehensible. Almost incomprehensible. I love how you put it to me earlier. You said this is really all about economics. It's supply and demand. If there was no demand, there wouldn't need to be such a great supply. Absolutely. Absolutely. Talk to us a little bit about that whole, how you're seeing that, that the men really are continuing to be a foundation for the problem. Absolutely. Um, if men weren't demanding sex, if men weren't demanding porn, then there wouldn't be a business about it. In, in Greece, for example, um, prostitution is absolutely legal. It is socially acceptable. 60% um, of Greek men use a prostitute once a month or more often. Um, and while it's normal and socially acceptable, um, the Greek girls don't want to supply the service. So over 95% of sex workers in Greece are foreign. And according to um, some of our police um, contacts, 99% of those foreign sex workers are trafficked. Um, so you have a massive demand that someone wants to meet. According to the CIA, uh, an average girl is worth $250,000 a year to a trafficker um, in net wow. profit. So if, if you have the girls, if you have, you have the demand and all you need to do is get a girl, um, if you remove the, the value of a person as a God-created thing, they simply become an item of stock. Mm. And so it doesn't matter whether I, I need to use that girl for porn, to generate the desire to get men into a brothel, or if I just I'm going to put them out into brothels. Um, but if we can get the men to not demand the sex, mm -hmm. then the the business won't be there for the trafficker. And not only not demanding the sex, but not watching porn. Absolutely. And I think that's the major issue because porn is what drives human trafficking. And so you know, a lot of guys, and and I'm sure anyone even watching this, it's like awesome if I said. Uh, you know, people see the movie Taken, and um, it's yeah. a great movie, a little bit of a Hollywood thing, but I'm so glad it's raised the, the awareness of trafficking. But if I say to guys, you know, I'm going to fill off 747, who wants to come and get a trafficker? Now, every man is like, yeah. I've got a particular set of skills, yeah. and I want to use A gun them. and a jet, That's they want to go. Let's go. Yeah. And, and we want to be Liam Neeson. Um, and I say, okay, well, the best way you can do that is to not press the button on your computer and not to go and buy the magazine. We could stop the demand overnight. Overnight. If the guys 
just because see what happens is we so objectify the woman we think the image I'm looking at on the computer or the magazine that I'm, I'm flicking through we've so objectified those women we don't actually really think of them as human beings so as but, our daughters that's right our sisters so our we nieces. can't so a guilt trip isn't going to do it because you could still just kind of go well it's just an image or many men and this is no doubt I hear it all the time you know Christine she just wants it I think you know I've got an 11 year old daughter and a seven year old daughter they often tell me their aspirations for their lives neither of them have ever said to me I want to grow up and be a prostitute or a yeah. porn star yeah. you know so it's never <laughs> yeah. been in the list yeah so um, and if I say to them is that what your daughter wants or what your wife wants it's like so somehow there's a disconnect mm -hmm. that what I am doing is actually fueling this industry we make the trafficker be a mafia man and he's really bad and me flicking through this playboy or That's me kind of going on the computer it's not really a big deal which you go no 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 that human being on the other side of that screen. Somebody had to star in oh, that movie. Oh, I'm telling you, yeah. how many cases have we been involved in where there's cameras in the room and that's how that porn movie that someone's just thinking is no big deal, that's where it's come from. She never was compliant in that making of that movie, never. Mm. We've got a little Hollywood glamour porn industry movie. Um, but seriously, you take away the ones that uh, some people say, Christine, you cannot take away someone's right to be a prostitute. And I'm like, I'm not trying to end prostitution. I'm trying to fight for the ones that don't want to be in there, which actually are about 99% of them. Mm -hmm. That's who I'm fighting mm -hmm. for. Absolutely. I want to ask you, we've talked a lot about what's happening in other countries. What have you seen happening here in the States, in the United States of America? Sure. And it's a deal here. You know, we've just opened our first um, 15 bed facility right here in North America for aftercare. We've been involved in prevention and awareness and with schools programming. America's a very big focus. The trafficking looks different to how it looks in Eastern Europe, but it's um, prevalent here as well. Most of the trafficking here would be? A lot, a lot of it is d domestic minor. So right in Europe, we're dealing with girls who are transported from one country to another or, or forced into um, prostitution or forced labour even in their own country. Here in the US it's, uh, it's a l largely domestic minors who are, come from poor socioeconomic homes uh, and in most cases have been abused before they were ever even trafficked, mm. so, which is endemic of a whole bunch of social issues beforehand. But um, one girl who we were recently talking um, with authorities about, she, she was trafficked across the country when she was 16. She escaped and went home. Um, and, and when she got home at 19, her trafficker knew where to find her. So they simply went back to home and rather than grabbing her to start with, they grabbed one of her friends. Um, they dismembered her friend in front of her um, and then said, now, um, we're not going to hold you, but just if you don't do exactly as you're told from now on, when your mum, your dad and every other person that you know disappears, um, then you know that you did it to them. Mm. Um, so th that, is, that is a horrific story, but it's not yeah. actually that uncommon. And, and I don't think, and, and it's in the States. It's like it, it's yeah, not yeah. somewhere yes. random you know, know, in no, some other that, country. This that's is happening. Good Bible Belt, Miss yeah. Midwest. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, after hearing stories like this, people want to know what they can do. And we can't all be Liam Neeson. No. We cannot all be Nick and Christine and go out into, you know, Thailand and everywhere else. But we can partner with people who are doing it, you know. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, I think it's so important to recognize that these are just regular people who <laughs> saw some signs and went, huh, let's ask a question about that. And then they took the next step. They were willing to not just hear something and then go on about their lives. They wanted to go on and do the next thing. And we can all do that as well. And it might not yeah. look the exact same way as setting up an organization, but um, it might mean partnering with this organization. Or it might just mean the next time you see something that bothers you, the next time something that's on your heart bothers you and you see a poster or a sign about something, that you might be starting your heart to take the next step I mean, imagine what, how many people would have not been rescued had there not been a couple of regular people that happened to pass some posters and go, you know what, I'm going to do the next thing. Yeah. So we're so grateful that you did, but we need to know how to partner with you. And sure. one of the main ways that you can, I want to tell you right off the bat, I know that Nick and Chris are going to echo this, one of the, the most powerful ways you can help is to pray yeah. for these girls. Like when you see, or girls and boys, when you see um, a milk carton, and it's got the pictures on the back of the milk carton. I don't even know if they still do that anymore. But they have um, a billboard sometimes on the, on the street when you're driving by. Um, or 
I have been thinking about this little girl named Madeline. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw her posters six or seven years ago. Her parents have been on Oprah Winfrey. You know, it's yeah. been kind of on the cover of some magazines. And I remember at the time thinking about this girl because I was walking through the London airport and I saw the posters of Madeline. I kept asking, who is this little girl named Madeline? Of course, we kind of, most of us know the story now of little Madeline that's been gone for six years now. And it never occurred to me until I encountered you guys that she probably was trafficked, mm -hmm. that it wasn't just a kidnapping case. Yeah. And there are so many kids that are missing now and we just say it's kidnapping. And many of them, it's, it's trafficking. They've Absolutely. been taken for the purposes we've been talking about today. So listen, the main thing you can do is be in prayer about these little faces that you see, when you see these, these faces, don't just let it pass you by. Say, God, bring these people back home. Um, a prayer that Chris and Nick prayed um, recently and their organization prayed because they were in a specific country where um, the government, the police forces weren't doing anything to help them. They were saying, we can't help you anymore. And you know what they prayed? I love this. They prayed that the clients, the men that were going into these brothels, that, that their hearts would be so convicted that they would actually want to rescue some of these girls. And guess what? It happened. Yeah. A man went into a brothel and he told a young lady, you know what, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And he did. She jumped out of the window to him. He took her to the police station. And so what if we can just pray that God totally. will change the hearts of the people that are going to victimize uh, these young people and some not so young people um, and that God will change lives. So you can pray. That's one thing you can do. But where can we find A21 online? What can we do tangibly yeah. to help support what you were doing in rescuing I love um, that question fellow because, human um, beings? If, I think if you go to the A21campaign.org, um, on there has got, we've got 21 things you could do today. Okay, whether you're a stay at home good. mom with six kids that you're homeschooling or whether you're a corporate executive and everything in between, there are 21 things that you go, you know what, I can do that one right now. Because mm -hmm. I think if you don't empower people, you cause frustration and paralysis. And what we want to do is put tools in people's hands and say, here's one thing you can do. Absolutely. So a21campaign.org, I want you to go there right now now because there are 21 things listed there and if you'll do one thing if I'll do one thing together we can help them to abolish slavery in the 21st century um, would you please help me by thanking them for being here uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.